Happy Easter, my friends. We are so sad that you're not joining us in person, uh, but we're very glad that you get to join us here online. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. I have a few brief announcements and before we get into our Easter sermon for today. Uh, first thing is, if there is any way we can be praying for you, church, we would love to pray for you. Please text 97,000 with any prayer requests. We'd love to pray for you this week. Uh, there are so many different things going on here at the church. Check out the website, agorabible.org, for more information on upcoming events. We've got our golf tournament coming up. We've got our ladies' tea coming up. We've got camp for the kiddos coming up this summer. We'd love for you to be a part of all of those things. You can register online or on the app. And finally, uh, man, the, the website or the app is also a great way to give. If you'd love to support the ministries going on here, we'd love for you to do that. Now, before we get to Pastor Scott's message today, uh, the reason why we do all of the ministries that we do, why we have all the events that we do is because we believe that God is on the move. He's working. He's changing lives. And so we wanted to highlight this video from Tom Corning sharing a little bit about what God's been doing in his heart and his life. So check out this testimony. Some of my earliest, happiest memories are when my mom would read the Bible to me at night before bed. She raised us in the church. I'd gone out to a, a youth uh, trip to Montana, but coming back, I, I like accepted the Lord into my heart, uh, accepted Jesus into my heart. It was such an amazing, amazing day, amazing time. And about six months after that, my family started going through some really hard times, some really difficult challenges. Um, things got really dark, and um, it kind of uh, it kind of crescendoed at, at the passing of my dad. When I was about 19, my dad passed away. I had not like built a relationship with Jesus. I wasn't praying. I wasn't talking with him. I was kind of like isolating and bottling up a lot of the feelings and it was uh, it was a really really difficult time and I had a lot of guilt I have two younger brothers that I wasn't there for them that I I knew that they were going through a lot of the same things that I was going through and a lot of shame and guilt and hurt and sadness and anger and just a lot of a lot of things and there was just there's just a whole in, in my heart, in my life, a loneliness that it really kind of set in. In my early 30s, like kind of looking back at it now, there's all these events, these all these people that I, that really meant a lot to me that had started doing these things that like started softening my heart. Like my Aunt Donna had given me a, a Bible that she gave to my dad. And I'd, I'd met Kristen and she, you know, it was kind of saying that she wanted to start going back to church. And then my mom was out here visiting at one point, and my mom, my mom says to me, you know, your life is going so well, the only thing you're missing is Jesus. I heard the Lord speak to my soul, like as real as, as can be, and he, he just asked me, how long do you have to walk alone? And it just leveled me. I couldn't believe. I realized Jesus was there the entire time, has been with me, even though I wasn't, you know, in relationship with him, wasn't thinking about him at all. I knew that, like, Jesus was the answer and was everything. I was so used to, for years and years, carrying around that loneliness, carrying around all that guilt and all of that. And it was just, it was gone. I knew uh, that my life had changed forever and it was so good. I turned my life over to, to the Lord. I said, whatever you have for the rest of, you know, rest of my days, I wanna give that over to you. It's like I was marching to the beat of my own drum for a long time. You know, how I'd think about or feel about success and money and marriage. Everything is so different and so good. There's just so much love here. You can't go another day without it. It's so incredible. I want to serve people. I want to help serve people. I want to help people feel the way that I feel and, and that closeness with, with the Lord that I have. Who I was before versus when Jesus came into my life and, and asked that question, uh, 
There is no doubt in my mind that I'm a new creation. Well, greetings, online church family. Really just a great opportunity. We really appreciate Tom uh, Corning just sharing just a little bit of uh, his heart there. And it's so uh, amazing to be able to be a part of a church where there's just stories like that of life change, of people being um, made new and transformed from the inside out. And so really appreciate uh, that. Well, welcome to another online service. And uh, it's fitting, we've actually uh, titled this message as we're going into Easter weekend, Made New. And I was thinking about that idea and that concept and really being in a world where we're surrounded with uh, garage sales, Facebook marketplace, thrift stores. You come to some certain conclusions about things that you're okay getting used and then things that you would prefer to be new. I don't know what makes it on that list for you. We'll maybe chat about it as a church family on Sunday, but I took a little bit of a poll uh, with our staff today, things that they were like, you know what, I, th in my life, this has to be new, and some of these aren't going to surprise you. Things that made the, the list, a mattress made the list, uh, underwear obviously made the, the list, toothbrush, socks, uh, uh, nobody wants a used swimsuit for sure, pillow or pillowcase. Uh, I don't know how these last two made it, but dentures were mentioned. Definitely want, don't want to get used dentures. Uh, and then the last one, which is uh, to me a fairly obvious, was the mention of gum. Uh, I don't know how that made the list, but either way, things that you're okay with having uh, be used and ha things that you're not okay with being used. And I was thinking about that of what I discovered. One thing that didn't make that list that I would propose should be added to the list. A number of uh, years back, uh, when my wife and I were moving into the current home that we live in, it had kind of a loft area and the second story that had uh, kind of a hangout spot for our kids. And I decided, man, we need to get a couch. But we were like, man, but we don't have a ton to spend on this. And so I started hitting up Facebook Marketplace and uh, realized that you could get a much better deal. And so I found this Pottery Barn couch, little mini sectional that I uh, went into towards the city to uh, try to pick up for fairly uh, cheap and uh, uh, showed up. And upon a arrival, I had been dialoguing with the guy earlier in the day, upon arrival, opened the door of his place to just this wave of smoky stench. It was just like, almost like knocked you back a bit. And so I'm already in my mind thinking through, okay, how am I going to exit this situation? I'm clearly not going to want a couch from this environment. But to my surprise, the gentleman greeted me say, saying this. He said, man, I saw online that you're a pastor and knew you were sent here for a reason after the loss of my father. I was like, oh, okay, here we go. And so what do you, what do, you do? So I ended up getting an opportunity to share with them, uh, talking about Jesus Christ, got to pray with them, and literally left with a $300 sermon illustration, really thinking through of what was should have been on that list of things that you have to have new. I would suggest all of us add fabric couches to our list of made new. Now you might wonder why I'm bringing that up as we're going into this Easter service. And really the reason I suggest that is because when you think of what needed to take place, the reason that Jesus Christ came down, lived the perfect life, died on a sacrifice for us on that cruel cross was in order to make us new. It wasn't because we needed cleaned up. It wasn't because we needed a little bit of fixing or, or a, a, a fresh shine, but instead we needed a complete restart. We needed a, a fresh beginning. That's why in today's text, we're reminded that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Well, in today's sec section of 2 Corinthians, we timed it perfectly because it walks through some of those different areas that were made new because of the resurrection. Let me pray before we begin to explore those. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to gather around uh, your word, and your word brings life, it gives, brings clarity, it brings a revival, it brings repentance, it brings change, it brings newness, all the things that it offers, God, we ask for even in this time. We invite that in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Well, just to give you a little a bit of a, a background, if you're uh, more checking this out because it's an Easter message and don't regularly get to connect with us, just where we're coming from, we typically spend time each week working through sections of Scripture. Why is that? We go through Scripture because we believe it's the literal Word of God. We believe that God wrote a book approximately uh, through approximately 40 different diverse authors over 1,500 years with a focus on one thing, on him, on himself, on the one plan of a rescue, the only plan of rescue, Jesus Christ. So we're working through that. In the account that's given in Scripture, it tells us a little bit about what life was like after Jesus was here, the start of the church. So here what's happening is a newer believer, or a young believer by the name of Paul that God was using mightily, is writing a letter to one of the early churches. The church was found in Corinth. It was basically a church that was needing some support. They were having a, a little uh, being misguided, basically slipping back into some unhealthy patterns. They are being misdirected by their culture and really needing a, a little bit of a, a nudge or maybe the better word would be shove back in the right direction, reminding them that they have been made new and that their eyes should be on the eternal, not on the temporal. For us, my hope is similar, that God would use this to maybe shake us up. I know I need to be shook, shook on occasion, and this is similar in this text, definitely has that potential. So starting in verse chapter 5, verses 11 through 21 here today, verses 11 and 12 are kind of finishing the thought that he's been on. He's trying to make it a defense, if you will, for himself. He continues doing that, mentioning his intentions, of, uh, talked about in previous sections that he's compelled by God, uh, that he has a fear of the Lord, that he's sincere, all of those things that drive his ministry Picking up in verse 13, he begins to explain what might come across as seemingly irrational behavior, but it's because he has new motivation in life. Take a look at verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we're in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, Therefore, therefore, all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That's what we're celebrating today, his resurrection. But let's walk through this. The first thing he points to, confirming what many people have suggested for years, is that Christians are a little bit crazy. Some might suggest we're a little bit off our rocker, a little bit weird. What I like about uh, what he explains there, he says, if we are in our right mind, it's for you. In other words, we're toning it down. We're crazier than you even think. He's admitting to that, acknowledging that, and he points to the reason behind that, why we might come across as a little bit uh, out there to the world around us, he says in verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ controls us. We're so compelled. This was Paul's story. He, had the, he, he was persecuting Christians. He was doing the exact opposite of what he's currently doing. And then he had an encounter with the love of Jesus Christ, an encounter with Christ himself. And literally, there was a 180 degree turn. Now he's compelled by it. I like that, that idea of it being motivation or, or, or it's literally taking control of him. It's like, I, I'm no longer myself. Basically, that's the description that he walks through. The love that he's compelled by is that it says, one has died for all. 
So what's he motivated? One has died for all. You think about it, 165,000 people die every day on this planet. That was a st statistic I stumbled upon this week. But why is it uh, such a big deal that one has died for all? The reason it's a big deal is the one who died for all is Jesus. And the reason Jesus is a big deal is because Jesus is God in an earth suit. God intervening, God stepping into humanity on a rescue mission for us to literally pay the penalty for our sins. I like that he's actually the idea that he's meeting the justice that he demanded. Basically in gospel in four words, Jesus in my place. Basically God treated Jesus like he was guilty of every sin possible so that he could treat us like Jesus. It's a, a flip-flop, a switching place. He treated him like we should have been treated. Sometimes when you stop and consider what a huge deal that was, the idea of God just watching by, watching on while his only begotten son is executed, is tortured, is mocked, is spit upon, the, just, the, the, just the, uh, the shock and awe of that whole experience, what that would have been like. We're going through as a family, a cur current year, we describe it a little bit of a, a year of mourning uh, where my son has plans to go off to college in the fall. And then my two daughters are just one year behind uh, him in a row. And so really over the next three years, seeing some major shifts and changes in our family and just thinking about my son as we're just kind of preparing our hearts for that hard goodbye in the college years, not knowing what life will look like on the other side of those four years it's left us a little bit just like saddened. Man, our, our one son. But blowing my, my mind is the concept of sitting by and watching, uh, in uh, that case, his innocent only son being murdered, being executed. It's just an unbelievable demonstration of love. It's the kind of love that should compel us. The kind of love that we've received should make us say, man, my life now looks different. It, it's, it's never going to be the same on the other side of that. We're told that he died and rose again. That's also what set apart not just who he is, but what took place. The only one in history to have victory over death. Then he tells us the outcome of that. Therefore, all have died. What do you mean all have died? A lot of times some of this figurative language is kind of like, well, I still feel like even after those who have embraced Christ, I still feel like I'm alive. But here's what happened. is Basically, I like the concept or picture of a factory reset. I don't know if you've had to deal with your phone before where it's given kind of weird issues or whatnot. And sometimes it might even get to the place where you literally have to do a complete reboot, bring it back to the manufacturer's suggested uh, screen, get kind of just uh, washing it and wiping it clean. That's basically what God is saying had to take place for us. Why? We needed a fresh start. It says in the text, no longer living for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. We're shifting allegiances. We're turning over. We're saying we're no longer living for self. Now we're living for him. That's what takes place when you commit to Jesus Christ. The self-life is done. It's finished. And there's actually freedom in that thought. Oh, to be done with everything revolving around me, 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 mine, 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 more, more, more. All of those things coming to conclusion when we're putting our life or wrapping it around him being the central focus. We see things in a new, through a new lens. Verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We'll repeat that first verse again. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. What does that mean? Basically, the idea of having new lenses, of seeing things differently. 
I uh, just had some adjustments after an eye exam to the lenses in my glasses. They, they haven't arrived yet, but I'm definitely looking forward to having some correction, being able to see close up, being able to see far. I guess, I guess they have these transition lenses I'm trying out, but basically the concept is this, is the ability to see things clearly now. That's what's on the table. He's saying, at one point, you saw Jesus through the lens of the flesh. People saw him as a blasphemer, as an as a, as a imposter, imposter. But now on the other side of his resurrection, they see him as the one true God. You see, that's what changed. There's a lens that happens for each one of us when our eyes are open to who Jesus is. And the transforming effect of that ripples into the way that we see those around us as well. Not just people walking around as blobs of flesh, but literally seeing people as either lost or found. Lost or found. I was reading this article this past week that was describing what took place with the Titanic back in 1912. Sometimes it's kind of crazy to think that it's actually not that long ago that that took place. But on the other side of its sinking, they, in order to respond to so many families that were wondering what had happened to their loved ones. Back in London, they had put up this massive, from my understanding, basically a chalkboard. And it basically had two lists. It had one list that said lost, in other words, they discovered a body where they've lost their life, or those who were miraculously found and rescued, basically helping families navigate and determine what had happened to those that were dear to them. For us, it's basically saying the same thing. We're no longer seeing things through the physical sense. We're not seeing people based on attractive, unattractive, one race or a different race, uh, living in one part of the country. He's like, we're done with seeing things through a physical lens. Now we're being invited to see things through a spiritual lens, having eyes to see people for man. They either desperately need rescue or they're in Christ. I think that's important for us to understand too. It doesn't just impact the way we see others. It's the way in which we see ourselves. Because those of us who have embraced Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, now all of a sudden, no, we're no longer defined by our past failings. We're no longer fa- defined by, by our shortcomings or our struggles. We're defined, we're seen through the lens of Jesus Christ. We're wrapped in him. That's the lens in which our God sees us. And that changes the way we approach. We're a, as we're told there, we're a new creation, no longer defined by those old things. So what are we seeing? New motivation, new lens. Next, we see a new relationship. Verse 18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. What does it say there? Through Christ reconciled to himself. For if you think about that word reconcile, what comes to mind usually that is associated with some kind of relational conflict that you have with somebody. That's usually something that's unsettled, that needs to be worked through. We're told in scripture as much as is possible with us to be at peace with all men. That's what we're called to for sure. Something that's a part of our human experience. But for us to understand, to find out that somebody has issue. I don't know if you've had that before. You find out that somebody has had an issue with with you that you didn't realize they had an issue with you. I remember back when I was 15 years old, I was at a, at a health club and uh, getting a workout in and uh, a guy came up to me and I didn't realize that I had been talking with uh, the girl that he was dating and he was not happy about that. He was 20 years old. I was 15 years old and he warned me about it and then started to pretend like he was walking away and cu- came back with the hardest Mike Tyson uppercut cut, caught me in the jaw, literally laid me out. It was literally one of the more miserable experiences of my day. This gentleman actually later ended up li- going to jail for murder. Thankfully, it wasn't me. But this was a pretty intense moment when you find out somebody that has power over you is holding something against you. 
Now elevate that by a, a billion, and that's what we're dealing with. Our, our maker, we're told, has issue with us. We have an unsettled relationship. You're like, well, what do you mean? Scripture actually is very clear. It describes us as enemies of God. It describes us as objects of his wrath. That should be very concerning to any thoughtful person. That's why it's so important for us to understand what's taking place here. That God intervened on our behalf in order to reconcile us to himself. What does it say in the text? It says, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against us. Two observations. First, understand that this is the one and only offer that's on the table. It's saying, hey, he was reconciling us through Christ. Not through a variety of different options. This is literally the one and only where and, and elsewhere in Scripture we're told no one comes to the Father except through him. So there's not a bunch of options. In fact, it's important to, to understand the bottom line is this. He is our one shot of having a relationship that's severed because of our sin restored to a perfect God. It's only through his righteousness, it's only his provision is our one hope for a restored relationship. Second observation, just from those couple of verses, it's only possible when our trespasses aren't counted against us. You might be like, well, how is it possible that he's able to do that and still be a righteous and good judge? Well, we talked about it in the last section, the idea that the penalty you owed, he paid. So because of that, because of us that we've been reconciled, we've had that relationship or potential for relationship restored, now we're given something. What does it tell us at the end of that section? And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. In other words, if you have gone to that extreme of a length to restore relationship between mankind and God, you would want that message to go out and he's saying, I'm going to use you. We visit that so often as a church and I visit it so often at church because scripture revisits it so often at church. It explains it very clearly in these last couple week verses as to what our new identity looks like. He says, therefore... Because of this, because of the work that he's done, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What does he call us there? Describes us as ambassadors for Christ. You see, when we embrace Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin, he's like, all right, I'm, I'm inviting you on the team. I'm pulling you in. You're, you are now with a, a new stamp, a new identity, who you are. Now you're defined by this. You are an ambassador. The first thing to realize, a couple things to realize about that reality. First thing to realize about ambassadors, think about it practically speaking. If somebody's an ambassador somewhere, they are somewhere that they don't belong. They're in a foreign land. What do you do in a foreign land? You don't get too comfortable. You don't get too, uh, you don't let your guard down. Think about all of the things when you're traveling that you do when you're somewhere that you're not familiar with. You don't get too comfortable. You don't let your guard down. And you definitely don't get distracted from the reason in which you are there. Can you imagine an ambassador showing up somewhere and being like, ah, I forget what I was doing here. No, of course not. What he's calling you is to be an ambassador representing him to the people in that land. Second thing to consider, that it doesn't say we should consider being ambassadors. What does it say? We are ambassadors. That is something that describes us. So it's not a question as to whether or not you or I, believer, are an ambassador. The question is whether or not we're a good ambassador of Jesus Christ. I remember, I don't know if you remember this, back in 2014, 
when Dennis Rodman, and I have no idea behind the scenes what happened to allow this to take place, but Dennis Rodman ended up going for one of the very first time an American had been in Northern Korea as welcomed in as an ambassador of the United States and spent time with their leader. And I just re remember like, what is happening right now as this bit of a uh, eccentric NBA, uh, former NBA uh, legend was there, and you're just like, how does this happen? And I was thinking, you know, how does that relate to this? can relate in one of two ways. It could be defined, you could use that to say, man, that's a, uh, an ambassador that didn't do a very good job of being an ambassador for the United States of America. Or you could say just the opposite as the connection point is that was a misfit ambassador, kind of like us. Kind of like our God choosing to use us, somebody that isn't definitely isn't qualified based on who they are, but based on who they're representing. That's the idea. He's called every single one of us to represent us. And what are we told God is wanting to do through us? It says he's making his appeal through us. What's, the, what's that mean? In other words, he wants to say something to the people in the foreign land. Well, what's the message? Sinners can be reconciled to God. That's the message. Sinners can be reconciled to God. They don't have to stay in that position of separation between them and God. So what we're offering to somebody, sometimes I feel like we get confused with the, the gospel message. We're not offering a life of purpose, although we may gain that. We're not offering to gain contentment, although that may come. We're not offering to reboot someone's marriage, not offering happiness or a sense of well-being. It's in fact, we're offering to have our sins forgiven. That is what is on the table. People don't understand how desperate their situation is to have their relationship with God restored because they don't realize or fathom what it would be like to spend eternity separated from God in torment and judgment. So because of that, the loving God, it says this, I love that description. It says that we implore you on behalf of Christ. Another word that could be used for implore is to beg or to plead. Basically, it's saying as his representative, he's wanting us to do whatever it takes. Plead with people. Please, I'm begging of you. Be reconciled with God. Have that relationship restored. And the question is, why wouldn't somebody want to respond to that? You have a God that is eager to forgive. That, that, that wants to, that he's, I saw this, this, this uh, statement this week by John McCarthy. He says, we don't have, a, have to convince God to save. We have to convince the sinner to receive. So we have a God that's eager. He, he's, he's going the extra mile. You couldn't say that he hasn't extended his hand to us. It's our response to that extension is really left in our court. But that's what we're called to as ambassadors, to plead with people. Please be recon re reconciled to God. And again, it ends with what the message is that's on the table. For our sake, he, God, made him to be sin, Jesus, who knew no sin. He was without sin, sinless, the only person ever to walk this earth. So that in him, in him, because of his finished work, we might become the righteousness of God. We might be seen right before God because of Jesus representing us. He took our place. So as I wrap up this message now, just a little bit different from maybe the, the rest of uh, the, the message series that we've been doing, my question is more for those of us that have never bent a knee, never called out to Jesus for rescue. My, my question for you, even today, thinking through this, is will you, do you want to accept Jesus Christ today? Think about those 165,000 people that pass away every single day on this planet. Many of them have no idea that they're 
racing upon eternity. No, they have no warning. There's no heads up. There, there's nothing that's saying, hey, this is a, about to happen. I was talking to one of our elders this past week. He was a parking lot. He was standing next to his car talking to some people, and somebody accidentally in the parking lot hit the gas rather than a brake and sent, collided in the car next to him, sent his car into him. He went flying in the air, landing on his hood, and he's like, man, Scott, it just all happened so fast. Thankfully, God spared his life, but you just just don't know when it's coming to an end. And so like we're called to, I'm doing that now, pleading with you on behalf of God to be reconciled through Jesus Christ to himself. And that can even happen even as I'm praying in conclusion now. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this opportunity to slow down and consider what does the resurrection have to do with me? The opportunity to be made new. We thank you for that, God. We thank you for your commitment to give us new motivation, to give us new lens in which we see things, to give us new relationship with you, to give us a new identity and calling and purpose in life, God. We thank you for all of that, God, for the person that's never called out to you, that they would even in these moments as I'm speaking to you now, that they would speak to you just with a, a simple prayer, acknowledging that they've fallen short of your perfect standard, that they've sinned in their life. They confess their sins. Then they embrace, they embrace you for who you are, God in the flesh who died on the cross, rose again on the third day, providing rescue through simple belief. But not simple belief in the sense of it doesn't mean change. Simple belief that demands a new life, a death of the old and a beginning of the new God. And you're so committed to doing that in those of us that call out to you. We thank you for this opportunity even now for that option that you give us through every single day that we're here on earth. God, I pray for the person that's maybe listening to this that just maybe needed a nudge to get more on track. That's maybe been drifting and wandering and just needs to get back on track. God, I pray for that person as well, that this might, message may even be the catalyst for that. We thank you and praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.